Throughout the course of WoW storytelling, many plots have come and gone. Some have just been outright forgotten and unfinished by Blizzard, creating a plot hole. A plot hole in traditional storytelling is when you break the rules you've set for your world with something that doesn't make sense with what you've set out, or is just a large inconsistency that leaves stories around it unresolved. And in this video, we're going to go over 10 plot holes that exist in WoW story, even though there are tons of them, as anything with a near two decade existence is bound to have mistakes. And starting us off at number 10, we have Xavius with his partnership with the Legion during the same expansion. Xavius was once a former counselor to Queen Ajara during the War of the Ancients. He was considered one of the best mages of Runga's rank and was one of the spearheads to try and allow Sargeras to come into Azeroth. Unfortunately for Xavius, Malfurion would put a stop to shenanigans, and Sargeras would punish Xavius by transforming him into a satyr. He would go on to turn other highborn elves into satyrs, warping them into loyal demons to fight for the Burning Legion. Eventually, Malfurion again would put Xavius down to trap his body in a tree and kill him within it. The tree that now contained his remains would continue to hold his soul, and it even survived the Sundering. It was believed that he was saved by the Old Gods at this point in order to survive, so it's here his faith turns to the Old Gods and their corruption. He would help orchestrate the corruption of the Emerald Dream, creating new sections called the Emerald Nightmare. Fast forward to Legion, and the Emerald Nightmare has successfully corrupted the World Tree Chandrasil within Val Shara. What's strange here is that this corruption is obviously Old God based, the very thing the Burning Legion wishes to extinguish and remove from the universe. The Void is what spurred Sargeras into creating the Legion, as he knows removing all life is better than a chance at a sort of Void Titan rising and not just killing everyone, but ending the universe as they understand it. So, somehow Xavius managed to cash into favor of the Legion and pulled a facade to portray himself as loyal to their cause like he was many years ago, but his true loyalties remained very much with the Old Gods. Would this Legion not be able to instantly tell what his power is and try to kill him for attempting to join their cause with the very thing they war against? It could be they know he will fail and are using him as a distraction, but it was quoted by Blizzard when Legion was announced that, with an army of vile satyrs at his command, Xavius will stop at nothing to vanquish all who oppose the Burning Legion. Even Zalatas says the demons can be corrupted all the same. It had to have been a massive gamble for the Legion to take and assume the corruption Xavius held wouldn't spread so quickly and consume their efforts and then lose their war in the ultimate long run. But if this isn't enough to convince you, Xavius should have been dead before the events of Legion anyway. After he was turned into a satyr, he was later killed again by Malfurion and Tyrande. Him returning somehow after his death is completely unexplained, and we can only theorize that it is because Nazoth intervening, or he follows the rules of demons doing well, where they can only be killed in a very specific location. Twisting Nether for demons, and Rift of Alm for Xavius. There's no real definitive answer. And at number 9, we have the Vindicar, specifically in the instance that it's almost never used for the player or ally characters after its initial use in Argus. The Vindicar was introduced to players during the final patch of the Legion expansion, patch 7.3, where we went to Argus itself to fight against the Legion. It was created to travel the stars and allow travel to Argus by the Draenei of the Exodor. Throughout the campaign upon Argus, players would use the Vindicar as their main headquarters and means of travel throughout the planet and its zones. Players also had the ability to call down strikes from the ship to launch an orbital strike upon an enemy NPC in the open world with Light's Judgment. This same orbital strike was used upon the fortress of the Legion itself to blast holes into the Citadel and fight off hordes of demons during the Antorus Raid. The Vindicar has proven to be a very resilient and powerful asset, as it can withstand the might of the Legion itself, and with the Legion out of commission, the ship now lies in the complete possession of the Army of the Light, who have since joined the Alliance. This is the same army with the Lightforged Drenai. The plot hole aspect of the ship is trying to figure out why the Alliance never really used it offensively as an advantage against the Horde during the events of Battle for Azeroth. It had the ability to orbit Azeroth itself and send strikes from above at any point, and players can only speculate why Anduin never chose to use such a powerful weapon against his foes. It's speculated Anduin found it dishonorable to strike the Horde and potentially harm citizens during the war, which is completely fair, but this is never confirmed. Even when the Fourth War began to end towards the later points of BFA, the Alliance never utilized the Vintikar against the forces of the Void. And very recently, it was never used to attack the Incarnates in Dragonflight. There are plenty of scenarios where it can be safer to use with no crimes taking place, yet never is. The only marked usage of the Vintikar is during the Horde campaign on Dressfar. Horde players will invade Dressfar and see the Army of Light using the ship defensively to set up camps and barriers to shield the attacks from the Horde. It's also used to teleport troops just before the events of the Battle for Dazarl or Ray to trick the Zandalari into deploying their troops into a land where they're not needed. Yet still, its offensive capabilities are not utilized. Some speculate that with the defeat of Argus, the Vindicar's resources are much more limited and can no longer draw upon whatever empowered it as frequently. 
This would explain why it isn't used, considering there is likely a large lack of Argonite, but in the Dragonflight 10.1.7 patch, players would canonically return to Argus for a short time to complete the Scene Red scenario achievement to unlock the Eridor as a customization for Draenei characters. We see Argus still exists, and people continue to live upon its ravaged lands, and to travel there, we use the Vindicar, proving it's still functional. This is a pretty insane feat as Argus is no longer so close to Azeroth as it once was in Legion. It implies the Vindicar had to travel all the way to its original point to complete this scenario and then back to Azeroth with the Eridar in tow. Overall, it's very strange why the Alliance would never make use of such a formidable weapon to win their wars easier. It's a bit nitpicky, as the wars are all won all the same, even without the usage of the spaceship, so it only earns a 9th spot on this list, but it must be said that the Vindicar surely would have aided every war effort thereafter Argus. And at number 8, we have a bit more Death Knight slander. In this scenario, it's how the Death Knights are able to get away with their criminal activities without any sort of repercussions. This entry mostly refers to the events that transpired within Legion expansion. As a Death Knight, you'd go around and recruit the new Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. This involves bringing back General Nazgrim, the former King Thor's Trollbane, Sally Whitemane, and attempting to bring back Tyrion Fordrin. While Whitemane might not have the best track record when she was alive, Nazgrim and Thoris were once highly revered war heroes of the respective factions. Bringing them back absolutely angers the Horde, as Darren Morgrain himself quotes such to occur. Following this, when attempting to revive a fourth horseman for their cause against the Legion, the Death Knights storm the Lighthouse Chapel. The Knights of the Ebon Blade would go on a crusade and kill all paladins and priests that stood in their way to retrieve the body of Tyrion Fordrin, one of the most popular and well-known paladin characters in existence. The Death Knights fail at this and retreat, but many paladins and priests lost their lives in the process. This is almost never brought up again in the lore, and the world is just fine with the Death Knights continuing to go unpunished for such an event. Perhaps the most notable atrocity the Death Knights had committed was when all the player classes would embark on their journeys for a class mount. In the case of the Death Knights, they would slaughter many red dragons and interrogate more in turn for information regarding the mount they seek. The dragons are already short in number during this time, and we directly remove Alexstrasza's own kin from the face of the earth, all for a mount. There have been interactions and dialogue where Alexstrasza mentions these events to the player characters as if they had done them. For example, in the Night Fae campaign for the Shadowlands, when you must visit Alexstrasza at Ysera's request, she says, You have a great deal of nerve coming here, Death Knight. What do you wish to take from the Red Dragon flight this time? It's rather quick, and Blizzard forces her character to endure the presence of the Death Knight for gameplay mechanics, as they have placed the Death Knight into a scenario where they are still needed, like in the War Against the Incarnates. There is also another interaction where this is mentioned again in a single line with the NPC, Zalastraza. Basically, you must protect her as she attempts to cleanse the bones of a fallen red dragon in Dressfar, and once she's done, you may speak to her. Doing so, you can ask her as a death knight if this task has helped regain some trust in the red dragon flight, or just straight up attempt to kill her on the spot. If you do not try to kill her, she will warn you to not stray from the current path and leave. If you try to kill her, she will stun you and leave. It should be noted, she very begrudgingly accepts your help if you're a death knight, and does not take you lightly. Basically, death knights do some pretty messed up stuff to the living people of Azeroth, and seem to get away with these actions with no real repercussions, or very rare mentions of these actions with no punishment in sight, earning it a number 8 spot on this list as it can very directly involve the player themselves. And at number 7, we have the Nerubian and Maldraxxus architecture. If you were to play near the Shadowlands, or just ever visited Maldraxxus, you would quickly learn that the general aesthetics of the zone is that of the Scourge from Wrath, but with a much more twisted nature and more body horror-like in some scenarios. There would be many necropolises that float around the zone and large citadels in a fashion similar to Icecrown. The strange plot hole aspects of all this is how these designs were originally founded by the ancient race of Nerubians. Naxxramas was one of those ancient necropolises, and when the Nerubians were conquered by the Scourge many years ago, they began to adopt their structures into all of their buildings, like Arceus the Evanhold. So, how is this possible? It can't just be a coincidence. In an interview with Judge Hype with Steve Denuser, it is questioned if this is just an aesthetic or has a lore connection. Denuser goes on to answer that the influence of death has been present on Azeroth for a long time, before Nerzul even became the Lich King. He follows up with, Perhaps one day we will learn more about what the Nerubians were up to in their vast kingdom, and what terrible wonders might have inspired them. This implies that the Nerubians have always had some sort of access to Maldraxxus, and their architecture was heavily inspired from them. In addition, intentional or unintentional, these same ziggurats of Maldraxxus would often be inhabited by a similar spider species to the Nerubians, but they are known to have absolutely no correlation to the Nerubians and are just a native species of Maldraxxus. 
The Nerubians were known to be a race that had lived for thousands of years and evolved from the once old gods created a cure species of bugs. So when we jump into Mandraxis and see a species very similar to them, but are told that's just the way they are, it only leaves everyone very confused. It's hard to believe there is possibly zero correlation to the two races. Even when we consider the Nerubians built their empire of Maldraxxus in mind, it only begs the question at how they gained the ability to have such insight. At what point did it become possible for this of all species of old god bugs to peer into the realm of the dead? The very knowledge they could even do so is nowhere to be seen in the game itself. So if you had never known about this interview, you were more than likely even more confused. If anything, this just shows the handling of the Scourge and past lore within the Shadowlands as it was overall a mess with lots of loose ends because of the empty conclusions or errors like this entry. It can be seen as a pseudo retcon of the old lore, and now it's supposed to be the Scourge adopting their architecture methods by watching the necromancers of Maldraxxus and their lands, but this really takes away from the menace and horror the Scourge used to embody on its own, placing it at number 7 on our list. And at number 6 on this list, we have the Waystone in the Maw. In Shadowlands, players are introduced to the zone called the Maw, which is essentially the hell of the afterlife of WoW's universe. And it's hyped up to be completely inescapable, and harbors endless torture and suffering. The ironic thing about this zone, however, and what absolutely makes it lose all menace it may have had, is that not even a full hour into beginning the playthrough of the zone, you leave. It was almost instantly foreshadowing the story that was to come to the Shadowlands and how utterly confusing and inconsistent it could be. Blizzard was conveying an idea that the Maw is completely inescapable, and for players to just up and leave so quickly makes everyone immediately not perceive the zone as a threat. It's just annoying. So, why is it possible? It is briefly mentioned when you first leave the Maw, but the Waystone you click to escape responds to your presence just by being near it, and it allows you to exit the zone. How and why is there even such a gateway to leave the Maw placed into the zone in the first place? You would imagine the Jailer would not allow this gateway to be accessed in order to better secure his victory. It is said from prophecies in Corthian texts that a true Maw Walker would be able to save Corthia from disaster because they are attuned and a unique world soul. This world soul in question is understandably Azeroth's, and it wouldn't be the first time the player has a unique advantage to them that the named character in lores do not have such as the ability to speak to spirit healers on death. But isn't it strange that the Jailer would allow such a device to persist throughout this territory? Surely at first, the Jailer is just surprised such a thing is even possible and allows our escape as he does not believe us to be a true threat yet. Plot armor aside, once he began to learn more about the havoc we can actually cause via invading Torghast and killing his generals of the Maw, you would imagine the Jailer would remove the Waystone or make it less accessible to the player characters to better achieve his plans. It is theorized that this waystone was placed by the first one as a sort of failsafe, or was intended from the beginning a Maw Walker would make use of it. However, since the Jailer is already attempting to rewrite history and reality itself from the original vision of the first ones, it would still make sense for him to destroy or attempt to hide the waystones that allow the players to escape his realm. It just generally leaves the player wondering why this character who's supposed to be incredibly cunning allows his plans to be foiled so easily. And at number 5, we have Smolderon and how he goes missing in BFA. In the most recent patch in Dragonflight, patch 10.2, players embark against the new Fire Lords of the Firelands, Smolderon. To a large majority of players, Smolderon may appear as a new character altogether. But if you were a Shaman player during Legion and had completed the campaign surrounding your Order Hall, you'd have already met Smolderon by now. In Legion, the Earthen Ring tasks themselves with crowning new Fire Lord for the Firelands, kind of like a there must always be a Lich King scenario. They even convince the Elemental Lords to all team up and fight the Legion together when they are typically warring with one another. Smolderon would prove himself worthy of the title Fire Lord, and the Shaman character would even place the very weapon they yield in the raid into his hands to rule the Firelands with. He'll make a remark to the Shamans who've completed his former quest when you run into him again, saying, You shall fall to the very weapon you placed in my hands. An honor indeed, Shaman. Truthfully, Smolderon has never proved he was fiercely loyal to the player character, and was more than likely in the position to become Fire Lord all for himself. While it may seem two faces Smolderon to betray the Shaman character like this, the Elemental Lords have never really liked us mortals in the first place. When it comes to the Fire Elemental specifically, they may only thrive if there is more to burn. So any opportunity to expand their territory, like Smolderon is attempting in Amidrasil, will be a welcome one. Though this entry is about Smolderon going missing. After we crown him the new Fire Lord, he goes missing during the events of BFA. The Cold of Ragnaros at this time had attempted to revive the former Fire Lord, and when questioned about the disappearance of Smolderon, their leader only replied, all in due time. 
This implies Smolderon had intentionally gone into hiding and resurfaced during Dragonflight in a supposed partnership with the Incarnates. While it's possible for Smolderon to have the knowledge of the Incarnates actually existing, there is absolutely no way he could have planned to have joined them, as there was no way to predict that they would break free of their prisons and that the Dragon Isles would be reawakened. Even if he could, this means Smolderon can see into the future, which only questions how he would possess such an ability. Not only this, but his plan to join the Incarnates and being allowed to even do so is insane, especially with the Fire Incarnate Frack himself. Perhaps all of this is a stretch, and not true, but his disappearance during BFA is still a complete mystery, and we have no idea how such a thing happened. With Dragonflight coming to a close, as well, it may be a very long time before we get an answer surrounding this, especially since Smolderon is now dead and Frack stole his essence, who is also later killed. So any remnant of Smolderon is gone. And at number 4, we have the ending of the Everbloom dungeon. Everbloom has recently seen itself become a Mythic Plus dungeon in Dragonflight Season 3, and players are more than refreshed on its scenario. Generally, you'll be battling through the harsh lands of forests that have become overgrown by a forest called the Primals. These Primals are a plant-like race that attempt to turn the entire planet of Draenor into a jungle. They would succeed very quickly, as the spread is almost impossible to contain, and will even change the inhabitants around it. Thankfully, these primals have an internal enemy and an opposite concept known as the Breakers. These creatures were created by Agrimar himself to combat the primals to prevent the spread of the overgrowth further from taking over the planet entirely. We are most familiar with the species as the Gron, like Gruul the Dragonslayer. Because of this never-ending war between the two species, they constantly keep a balance for the planet unintentionally, as neither side can gain any sort of benefit or disadvantage. Though, if unchecked, it will spread very fast. The Everbloom sends players journeying through the harsh jungle lands in an attempt to slay its best lieutenants from spreading their influence further, as it has disrupted a Kirin Tor outpost being used to fight the Iron Horde. Players fight through the bosses and find the Kirin Tor camp has been overtaken by the vines, and they must be put down, as their minds are warped and no longer their own. It should be mentioned, these vines are a hive mind, and all of the land it expands to is shared by a single organism. Shortly after, we see one of the more powerful primals, Yalnu, go through a portal to enter Azeroth and resurfaces on the edge of Stormwind itself. Players immediately respond with the Karen Tor NBC mages to put down this threat, but as you exit the portal, you see right away the influence this creature has already begun. You fortunately put down the creature before it can infest the city in front of you, but the spread just stops and is never removed. It's implied that the Karen Tor camp is long gone by the end of Warlords of Draenor expansion, so the portal connecting to Draenor and Stormwind is no longer functional or has any real use. However, the vines on the side of Azeroth still remain. What's to say it can't create life for itself and just begin to spread to the city once again unprompted? In Season 3 of Dragonflight, Throne of Tides and the Everbloom were made into Mythic Plus dungeons. Interestingly, Throne of Tides saw a pretty large rework in its mechanics, but even more importantly, its lore. Previously, Neptalon was taken by Azamat when the dungeon ended, and we never heard from him again. But now he remains in place, and we only find Azamat back into retreating. This means Blizzard is able and open to retcon and change previous lore when dungeons are revisited in order to clarify potholes or just make needed changes to fit the current story. Although, when it comes to the Everbloom and defeating Yalnu, the vines persist. They aren't even shown to begin an effort to remove them, and the dungeon just ends. Is it an intentional addition? Maybe, but maybe not. This spread of the overgrowth has always seemed suspicious and possibly hints at what's to come to Azeroth. What further supports the claim this is probably intentional is the Antorus Raid, where we're involved with the Titans. During Arenar's encounter, you can spot a large Genosaur roaming your planet, and upon killing Agrimar, you may loot an item called Spore Mound Seedling. Spore Mound is another name for the plant species that invades Draenor and combats the Breakers. It also should be mentioned that there is a plausible appearance of the growth in Dressfar with the Fungal Infestation World Quest. Basically, you just call the farm by killing a bunch of orcs that look similar to the ones in the Everbloom. Dressfar is the only real zone with no druidism throughout its lore and BFA. So, these models can just be placeholders for some witch turning them into this, or something during the quest, but there's no sure way to know, as the NPC that tells you about the world quest only tells you some basic information, like kill these grunts for the Horde or Alliance. According to Chronicles 2, the Evergrowth only grew so large because the planet of Draenor just has way too much of the element of life. And Azeroth is a lot more tame, so maybe the Evergrowth just can't spread as far in Azeroth as it can on Draenor by itself but we don't really know for sure, since it's just one of the many abandoned plot points from Warlords of Draenor. 
and we have a constant reminder of it next to Stormwind. And at number 3, we have Zalatath and how the Blade version of her just disappears. In Legion, Shadow Priest players embark on a journey to retrieve their artifact, and along the way, they would claim an ancient weapon by the name of Zalatath, Blade of the Black Empire. This blade came with it a sentient soul that possesses incredible strength and knowledge that dates back thousands of years. Zalatath, before it reached the hands of the player, had come and gone through many other characters and lore, including a troll that inadvertently started the Troll vs. a Cure War. Regardless, the blade is used by the players as it gives them maddening whispers about events that once transpired to defeat the Legion. At the end of Legion, Sargeras plants his massive blade into the planet and its corruption was cleansed by using the artifacts of every class and specialization, including Zalatath. Then in BFA, we heard from Zalatath again where she had fallen into the hands of the Naga, presumably. A Tortolan by the name of Collector Kojo then accidentally stumbles upon the blade and instructs the player character to seek it out for insight. This isn't even the main or first disappearance of Zalatath, but how could the original priest character that wielded the blade during Legion have lost or misplaced such a weapon? It's incredibly powerful and was known to still have the sentient soul within it. Regardless, the player now retrieves the blade and helps give Zalatath a mortal body to now roam the earth. She then leads the player to collect three powerful relics to stop the Naga from creating a devastating storm on the world and then brings them to the Crucible of Storm's Raid. However, instead of stopping the Naga, Zalatath offers their relics to the old god Nazoth in a bargain for her freedom. Nazoth honors his bargain and frees Zalatath of the blade and then she departs the scene. It is here that Nazoth claims to Zalatath that the original blade must remain and cannot leave. So, in this current time, Nazoth, a literal old god, possesses one of the most powerful weapons of the Black Empire. The massive plot hole comes in when the blade literally is allowed to be taken by the Horde character. Why would he let the character take the blade after he just got it? For all we know, this is the direct cause of his downfall as it's one of the very few weapons that can actually bring him at a disadvantage in his current state. It is then given to Sylvanas who gives it to Nathanos who then gives it to Ajara as she claims she is the only one who can defeat Nazoth with said blade. How and when these deals were made, and why they were able to be done without Nazoth knowing, is beyond speculation for the players. Funny enough, when we run into Ajara again in the Nihilotha raid, where Nazoth has been freed from his prison, she still possesses the blade and then gives it to Rathion. Why did he not take it from Ajara then and there if he had lost it before? Nazoth is just once again letting himself loose here. Rathion then uses it on Nazoth himself to tear open his carapace and allow entry to Nazoth to defeat him. It's just completely out of character for such a master manipulator type character, especially as it is a very direct cause to his downfall. You could speculate that Nazoth is not actually dead and faked his death from the moment he was stabbed by the blade in BFA. It does kinda make sense and explain more why he would let the blade be taken from him, but there is unfortunately no way to prove this true. We may get more answers with the War Within or Midnight, but either way, Nazoth allowed himself to be defeated by acting foolish and not keeping the one thing that could defeat him to himself. And at number two, we have no current Lich King. Longtime veterans of WoW will know the famous words from Terran as Minithil, father of Arthas Minithil, quoting, there must always be a Lich King. Later, Tyrion then crowns Bolvar Four Dragon the new Lich King, and he persists as such until Shadowlands. The Lich King is a necessary evil in the WoW universe because they are the only ones capable of reigning in the Scourge from going berserk and consuming all the lands of Azeroth. So, when Bolvar was removed from his position as the Lich King, the Scourge immediately began to ramp it and cause chaos across the known continents. Even the more intellectual Scourge, like the San Leon, could no longer be forced to hold back their hunger and could let loose on innocence all around. As Darren Morgren puts it, like vicious warlords in the wake of their king's death. Ever since Shadowlands, there has not been a Lich King since. And we are left to assume the Scourge continue their rampage. There's no Helm of Domination to pull back the Scourge, and it cannot be assumed we defeated all the remaining Scourge on Azeroth. This is confirmed in an interaction between Bolvar and Darren Morgrain at the end of Shadowlands, where Darren confirms the Scourge continue to be a threat, and the Knights of the Ebon Blade will do what they can to hold them back. How is it possible we are able to hold them back still? They have persisted for so long, and select few can still turn more people into the Scourge when they kill another. During Wrath of Lich King, when there was a Lich King, they were debatably the strongest force Azeroth had ever seen. This can largely be attributed to how Arthas was commanding the Scourge at the time, but it is again quoted by Tyrannus that, without their master, the Scourge will become an even greater threat to this world. It implies, even without Arthas or Bolvar, we almost stand no chance. The only explanation we have for the remnants of the Scourge are that they are being fought against by the Ebon Blade and Icecrown Citadel is being kept from the grass by the same Death Knights. 
So, strangely, because of this dangling plot point, the undead could make another comeback in the future. And for the final entry on our list, we have the Jailer. The Jailer was a character introduced to players at the beginning of the Shadowlands expansion. He serves as the main antagonist of the entire storyline throughout the expansion. The Jailer, or otherwise known as Zaval, was once the Arbiter of the Shadowlands. This title is bestowed to a person who is deemed worthy to send every dead soul to a particular afterlife of infinite possibilities. So, originally, Zolval used to send every single soul that ever died to a certain afterlife. He was eventually removed from his position as he believes the first one's creations were flawed and must be remade in his image. Because of this, he was imprisoned in the Maw and was left there for almost all of WoW's known history. It is said that Zolval orchestrated the creation of the Hello Domination in Frostmourne, creating the Lich King. He is also in leagues with Sir Denathrys, who created the Nazar Zim to enter the living world and spread chaos throughout the many different magics and religions of WoW. So, subsequently, these Nathar Zim follow Zaval and his ultimate goals. This is more of a retcon, however, and not a plot hole, as it was originally perceived the Nathar Zim were demons as part of the Legion, and were typically their strongest magic wielders and generals. It does sort of line up with the spread chaos bit, because it was always known that Nathar Zim are the ones that helped convince Sargeras to create the Burning Legion and exterminate all life which subsequently empowers Zoval. It's also a retcon of lore that Zoval used the Primus to create the Himmel Domination in Frostmourne, as before, they were created by the Nather Zeman Legion. Overall, Zoval is aiming to rewrite reality and aims to use the World Soul of Azeroth to do so, a reality where all will serve him and obey his vision. While playing the expansion was never actually clear on his motivator to do such a thing, hopefully I've given you a quick rundown of what he's doing generally. The real confusion begins when we look into Zolval's original imprisonment and purpose. Why was he removed from the position of the Arbiter and replaced? Sure, he acts evil, but what if he's right? Is there a reason that the so-called First Ones are flawed and needed to change? These entities are insanely mysterious, and we know almost literally nothing about their existence other than they imply they are higher existence above even the Titans. Zolval's unwillingness to tell us his vision makes him an incredibly one-dimensional villain. That's just evil for the sake of it. His only moment where we may actually emphasize with him as a player is during his defeat, where he leaves us all with a cryptic warning about what is to come. His entire existence is a puzzling question, and we literally never learn his real intentions with even his siblings, the Archon, Denathrius, and the Winter Queen, disregard his existence. Most of Shadowlands usually just leaves you really confused and asking a lot of questions about other questions, and it's generally best to just now acknowledge it. On top of all this, Zolval also just lets the player character and named characters live when he has many opportunities to get rid of them. It is literally just plot armor that the only beings in existence that could possibly stop him are just being left alive is very poor writing, and just allows for a character that's supposed to be perceived as a very cunning strategist as an overconfident idiot. And this completes the list. There are many more plot holes in WoW that were not mentioned in this list, and as long as WoW continues to expand its lore, there can't be true plot holes as they can eventually be resolved in future content. Are there any other plot holes you wish to have seen here, or have any ideas for future videos like this? If so, let us know down in the comments below.